I want to be at the meeting. I want to be at the meeting when all the saints get home. At the separation, of the right and the wrong. Columbia is a town along the Chattahoochee River in the southeast corner of Alabama. People settled here long before Alabama was a state. It's been an important center of trade and a place of innovation. There is a rich history here worth enjoying. We can learn about past generations and their contributions to the people of today. This past can help inspire the present to move forward into a bright future. The Columbia area was settled by Native Americans thousands of years ago. Between 800 and 500 years ago, a group from the Gulf Coast to the south traveled up the Chattahoochee River, possibly in dugout canoes, to the mouth of the Omusi Creek. Here, they built a village and a platform mound. This became the northern extent of this culture. Here, they planted crops, built their homes, and raised their families. The most recent Native Americans to inhabit the area were the Yamasee, who may have been pushed here from farther east by colonies pushing westward. In 1818, Columbia was located between areas controlled by the Seminoles and the Creeks. In the early 1800s, settlers of European descent found their way to the area. The town of Columbia was started closer to the Chattahoochee River than where it is now. In 1826, it became the seat of Henry County for seven years before it was moved to Abbeville to the north. The town was a port of call for steamboats for many years and was home to the first female to receive a captain's license, Callie Leach French. The steam calliope that she played on her ship, the new sensation, is at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia and may be the last of its kind in existence. The steamboat traffic decreased in the 1880s when the railroad lines began passing through the area. Due to the occasional threat of river flooding, the town gradually moved to higher ground on a rise to the north and away from the river. However, Omusi Creek and the Chattahoochee River continued to be a vital part of the town. Columbia's first known incorporation in 1870 lasted less than a decade due to the population fluctuating. In 1880, Columbia was reincorporated and has been incorporated continuously since then. Columbia adopted electricity years before the vast majority of Alabamians. The first electric street lights were erected in 1900. A group of Colombians built a wood-fueled steam plant on the corner of Main and North Street, which operated for 11 years. In 1918, the same year construction began on Wilson Dam along the Tennessee River in North Alabama, Columbia Power Company finished two hydroelectric dams on Omusi Creek. The Bates and Blewett dams began generating electricity to both Columbia and the surrounding region. Blewett Dam was remote controlled from Bates Dam, further upriver, which was a unique feat of ingenuity and engineering. The Bates plant was run by Mr. William W. Peterson, despite the loss of his hands in a railroad accident. Alabama Power Company recognized the importance of this company and acquired it in 1925. Columbia became the birthplace of the Southeast Division of Alabama Power. Unfortunately, in the spring of 1928, 18 inches of rain fell, flooded the region, and severely damaged the hydroelectric power plants, and they were abandoned. The shell of Bates Dam is still standing, but the creek has carved its way around it. Still, the area continues to be important to power generation, with Joseph M. Farley Nuclear Power Plant being just six miles to the south. Despite the setback, Columbia continued to move forward into the early 20th century. The town grew, buildings went up, and there were even horse races through the center of town. 
The 1940s and 50s were an active time for Columbia with many businesses operating in the downtown area. There were grocers, drugstores, pool rooms, and industries including cotton gins and a peanut company. Columbia was and is a rural town with a tightly knit community. Columbia had factories that made bricks and blouses, feed mills, a cucumber plant, peanut processing, and later, Russell Mills had a clothing plant. The town of the 40s and 50s included parts of the town first built in the 1800s and early 1900s. One of these older buildings was the Henry County Branch Courthouse. Built in 1889, it served as a Branch County Courthouse until 1903, when Columbia became part of the newly formed Houston County. It was then transformed into a large elementary school with many classrooms and a cafeteria. The building was demolished in the 1940s in favor of a new school. After its removal, a new city hall was built in front of where the courthouse once stood. It was finished in 1948 and housed the fire department as well as the town jail. Parked inside, was the town's 1943 Chevy fire engine. At the southeast corner of Main Street and North Street was a steel water tower erected in 1894 and a community hall that once housed the hub of the town water supply and the first electrical generator before that. Just west of the community hall is one of the oldest buildings in the town, the Old Jail. It was built in the early 1860s during the Civil War when Columbia was a major port for the cotton plantations of the region. It contained two cells lined with iron bars and iron spikes driven into the interior walls to deter escapes. Renovation efforts to restore the building began with the 1976 Bicentennial celebration and the jail is still standing. To the northwest, on the corner of Washington and North, was Pace's blacksmith shop. Here, agricultural equipment was repaired and new parts were crafted. It was housed in a building that was a part of the R.E. Mercier cotton gin. To the east was the Rivenbark Ice and Cold Storage Company. This complex provided ice and stored meat for the town. Now, only a small number of foundation stones remain. In the early 50s was a cold storage. And they killed hogs and, and put them in an area that they would have them and people go there and get them a part of their ham or, or ham, bacon and stuff and they would slice it for them. Further east, the downtown area began with a livery stable and mercantile store. Owned by the father and son E.W. and A.D. Wilkerson, and later sold to the Chamber family. The livery was built between 1903 and 1910. When the Wilkerson's owned the livery building, it provided housing and feed for horses. In the 1930s, there was a horse-drawn hearse and a four-wheeled carriage in the back of the building and dry goods in the front. That was a stable, and when the people came here, the black people, when we came here, that's my daddy, and all of them would go in there, and that's what they tie the news in there. The mercantile store sold a variety of goods from clothing to horse collars. The six foot four E.W. Big Dad Wilkerson would sit in a rocking chair and play checkers with Coca Cola bottle caps on top of a nail keg with one of his friends. In later years, the livery became a senior center and the mercantile store became American Legion Post 166 for the local veterans. Heading north along Main Street, there were two competing hardware stores, first Chambers and then Blackwell's. Mr. Blackwell was known to have a small gambling operation around the side of the building. The old men would get out there on the north end of the thing and they'd play uh, checkers and dominoes for money. They did a little gambling around there. Mr. Blackwell liked it too, and all the older guys would do that. They'd play checkers and dominoes for money and, you know, gambling on it. 
Actually, the old man would shoot marbles too. Did you, can you believe that? Wasn't yeah. a lot going on back in those days, you know, the forties yeah. and fifties. They'd shoot marbles and all. They were gambling all of it. Now. All it was money. Next to Blackwell's was a small, simple brick building belonging to the local telephone company. Next to the front wall along the sidewalk was a brick telephone booth. In recent years, the building was renovated to be more ornate. Next to the telephone office was a building that was the location of multiple businesses, including law offices and the Anglin radio and TV shop. This building was followed by a low cinder block wall where local children would sit. Behind the cinder block wall were steel bars to prevent foot traffic between the Anglin radio and TV shop and Lanford's drugstore. Lanford's drugstore was popular in the community for many years. They sold groceries, candy, and other household items in addition to medicine. Very nice store. But we as blacks, during that time, you had to go around to the back door. Even if you bought a coma ice cream, you'd pay for it and they'd come back and hand it to you back. Next to Lanford's was a narrow storefront that changed owners several times from a pool hall to F.A. Bryan and Sons feed store to Saliba store, among others. The next storefront was a longtime facet of the downtown community, Hunter's Grocery Store. Many items were sold here, including canned goods, meats and cheeses cut fresh in the store, eggs, produce, and tobacco products. It was owned by Ennis Hunter, who, with his wife and kids, ran the store Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., without fail, from 1947 until the mid-1970s. If there were still customers, the doors would stay open. Saturdays were busy. This was when the farmers would come to town to shop. The parking spaces along the streets would be full all day. The wood floor was a dark brown and had to be swept every day. Just a little further down the street was the Morris Pool Hall. Here, local shot pool, drank beer at the bar, and ate pickled eggs. It had a wood-burning stove in the back. A local barber shop was housed in the following building. The pool room and barbershop storefronts were later combined into Windsor's parts store. And one of the barbers along the way couldn't read, but he bought a paper every day. He looked at the pictures and he'd talk about the pictures to his customers and they didn't know that he couldn't read because he lived out in the country and uh, came to town to cut hair. And he uh, just didn't want people to know he couldn't read. And after he was older, he went to one of the night schools and learned to read. And when he went into the lady and carried his Bible in one hand and the Dothan Eagle in the other, and he said, I want to read both of these. And then I don't want to read anything else. Most of the businesses along Main Street had coverings over the sidewalk to guard shoppers from the hot sun of summer and cold rain of winter. Adjacent to these businesses was Columbia Drug Company, run by Mr. John Beasley. The young people of the town enjoyed sitting at the marble top soda fountain, eating supreme ice cream, and listening to the record player. On the southwest corner of Main Street and Church Street was Gilbert's Grocery that was later bought by Mr. Nix. It was heated by a pot-bellied stove and Hunter fans moved the air in the hot summers. Like Hunter's Grocery, meat and cheese was cut to order. Animal feed was kept in the back. The ornate cornices of the sidewalk covering for this building can be seen in some of the earliest photos of the town. It was fondly remembered by some of the residents of Columbia. And Fox uh, had a house, but he wouldn't leave it. He, he rented it out to a family. He used to sweep up for Mr. Carlton Nix, and that was where that little park is right over there now. And um, he was in there and went to sleep back on some feed bags in the back. And so Mr. Carlton closed up, and Mr. Carlton Nix ran, ran that store, and his wife was a math teacher, dang good, at the high school. Had her all my advanced math classes and everything, but um, so he was trapped, couldn't get out because it's padlocked the outside and everything. He didn't have a key. He couldn't get out. It wasn't a, you know, wasn't a push panic bar type thing back then. So uh, 
He just picked up the phone and started dialing. Well, Fox didn't know much about a telephone. It was rotary dial type phone back then. He finally got Mr. John Beasley, who was, was the uh, pharmacist. Around the corner, along Church Street, was another storefront that had many owners, such as Darby's General Store and Gilmore's Flower Shop. This was followed by a couple of warehouses and then Ed Brown's service station that later became the Junior Food Store and is now the location of a Valero gas station. On the corner to the west was Jackson's Ingram service station. Unlike other service stations, the original building is still standing. On the western edge of downtown is the Columbia Cemetery, which is enclosed in an ornate wrought iron fence and has a beautiful summer house at the entrance. There are over 1,400 internments, and the oldest known burial is from 1839. One of the burials is of Charles Summerford, who was killed by a lightning strike in 1892. According to legend, a tree once grew next to his grave, but lightning struck the tree and shattered Mr. Summerford's headstone. A replacement headstone was also struck and shattered, so city officials neglected to place another for fear that it would be struck also. Just east of the cemetery is Houston County High School. It is a large brick building that was built in 1936. It replaced the older high school that was erected in 1899 as the last home of the Columbia Institute and survived until it was torn down in 1940. The newer school was built directly behind the older one. To the west of where the old school stood was the Ag Building. Between the high school and the cemetery was a concession stand for the students. Across Washington Street to the east was a Pan Am service station on the corner, followed by the Blackwell Dry Cleaners. The dry cleaning chemicals were stored in what looked like a small metal water tower. This business had a unique front wall and had previously been Tom Justice's service station. Heading east from the dry cleaners across a gravel parking lot was the Linger Nook building. This two-story building was built in the 19th century by Captain John T. Davis and initially held the Old Manufacturer's Bank but was referred to as the old hotel for many years. This was possibly in reference to the second story rooms rented out to doctors and lawyers for their offices. Captain Davis was a Confederate officer during the Civil War and became a prominent, well-spoken of citizen of Columbia till his death in 1911. The building housed various businesses but had fallen into disrepair before being torn down in the late 1950s. It was a throwback to earlier days in Columbia. They had some rooms that they did rent out if people needed them. But it was a very active uh, hotel and had a lot of people staying in them because they had to go to Dothan and that's just too far to go to be in a hotel. If they gave out of rooms in the hotel, they would go to some rooms in the city that was that way. Turning north on Main Street and passing the Lingernook building on the left, there was a location that initially held Versi's Pressing Shop, followed by World War II War Bond Drive location, and then Williams Cucumber Plant. The cucumbers were in boxes that would be anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds for a person to pick up. Because they came in every night and picked up the cucumbers and carried them to uh, Cairo, Georgia okay. to be made into pickles. Next were two connected storefronts in a brick building. The first storefront was home to McKimmy's Swanee Store for a time, and then Adams Grocery Store. The owner, L.H. Adams, served the community both in the fire department and as chief of police. The Swanee stores were an early grocery store chain originating in neighboring Georgia. In the adjacent storefront was Weather's Shoe Shop and Dr. F.S. Twitty's office. Dr. Twitty graduated from the University of Georgia and John Hopkins University. 
He was a resident of Columbia from 1895 to 1940, where he treated maladies and helped deliver many children. Finally, on the west side of Main Street was a small brick building that was Charlie Miller's general store, the Columbia Post Office, and Gene's Gun Shop. To the north, across the street on the corner of River Street was, and is, the First Baptist Church. This elaborate brick building was built in 1885 to replace an older wood frame church. The congregation housed here is now over 175 years old, with more than 125 of those years in this church. The original steeple seen in the early 20th century had a spire extending up from a turret-shaped steeple. Just south of the church is the Wakefield House, which has stood next to the church for many decades. South of the Baptist Church, beyond the edge of the residences, was Bob Elliott's cotton gin, but by the mid-20th century, it was gone. By this time, it had become a place where the lot owner parked his peanut picking machines and then became the Columbia Auto Sales lot. Next to the peanut pickers was the Columbia Theater. Here, the people of the town could come to see the movies like High Noon and Singing in the Rain and cartoons like Bugs Bunny and Betty Boop. During intermission, when the reels were changed, moviegoers would buy candy, popcorn, and soda from the concession stand. And you have to go around to the side, come around to her and look at and I scoop my head down like that, and I'd go in. I'm mm. paying, you know. Mm -hmm. You see when I run the head down, I'd like go in by. Sometimes she'd catch me. <laughs> my, my, my nickname was Boop, B-O-O-T. <laughs> she said, Boop, come back here. I'll see you. I had to come back and pay my dime. <laughs> my dime to go, up, to go in there. And it was a dime. That's, that's when I first started. A dime, it went up to a quarter. Beyond the theater, but in the same brick building, was a storefront that went by various names, including Freeman's Five and Dime, Thelma Mercier's Cafe, and Walt's Diner. Now, the theater was right beside Walt's Cafe, wasn't it? It sure was. Okay. Now, we, when we were like 14, 15, and we'd come down here from practicing ball, and go to Mr. Walt's and get her something to eat. Yeah. I still, I feel like I can taste those hamburgers. They uh, have a unique taste to them. Yeah. The south wall of this building was painted white and was the backdrop to a service station on the corner. The service station went through several owners, including Ed and Charlie McGriff, Mr. Woodham, who ran the shell station here, and later Mr. Birch. This corner is presently occupied by a True Value hardware store and gas station. Turning east onto Church Street on the left was the lot to the service station, followed by the Columbia Post Office that was then home to Bristow Feed and Seed. The buildings further east included Lois Bryan's Beauty Parlor and Radney's Casket Company. A short walk to the east on the south side of the road was the Columbia Methodist Church, Though it was brick by the mid-20th century, it began as a wood frame church in the late 19th century. Across the street from Bristow Feed and Seed and to the southeast were three cotton warehouses where the Dollar General now stands. These warehouses were where Mr. Oakley stored the cotton bales from his company's gin. These were some of the largest buildings in Columbia. Bales of cotton were stored in them. We'd go in, in all those buildings along that. He had cotton stored in them, and, and they were just boarded up. We never, you'd go in the back side, the front side, I never saw open unless they were unloading, uh, loading cotton out, you know. But they'd store bales of cotton in there. We'd go in there and play in there. On the southeast corner of the intersection of Main Street and Church Street was a standard oil station. It had a smaller car wash, a kerosene pump, and multiple neon signs. It had a gravel parking lot rather than asphalt. The car wash structure remains on the lot. To the south of the service station along Main Street was initially Charlie McGriff's grocery store and then became McKimmy's Swanee store after it moved from across from the theater. 
the business was taken over by Mr. Jernigan after Mr. McKimmy retired. Among many other items, shoes and overalls were sold, as well as hoop cheese cut to order. Next to the Swanee store was the Bank of Columbia. It was started in the early 1900s and served the community for nearly a century. The most publicized thing to happen in Columbia occurred the morning of January 17, 1958, when the Anglin brothers robbed the bank at gunpoint. They tied up Walter Oakley Jr. and his staff in the back before forcing Mr. Oakley to open the safe and empty out the drawers. They fled with $19,000 in cash in two separate getaway cars. After an FBI manhunt of the region, they received a tip that one of the brothers had a girlfriend in Hamilton, Ohio. Shortly after a raid on the house of the girl's father, the brothers were captured. Clarence and Alfred Anglin were sentenced in federal court to 15 years as they were already wanted for other crimes, and their brother John, who had no criminal record, got 10 years. The sentences were shortened due to no blood being shed, and they claimed to have used toy guns. The three men were then tried in the Alabama State Court and received an additional 25 years each. They were initially sent to prison in Atlanta, where Clarence and John attempted to escape. After being caught, they were sent to the maximum security prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, where they again attempted to escape. This time, they were sent to the island of Alcatraz that was believed to be inescapable. On the night of June 11, 1962, the Anglin brothers, along with fellow inmate Frank Morris, escaped from the prison never to be seen again. Most officials believe the prisoners drowned in the cold waters in San Francisco Harbor or were eaten by sharks, but it is possible that they escaped so they continued to be wanted by the U.S. Marshals. Alfred was later killed by electrocution while attempting escape over an electrified fence with rubber tubing that failed to insulate him. The building now houses the Columbia Historical Society. Next to the bank was a small shop that contained dry goods groceries under several owners. The small shop was between the bank and one of the larger storefronts in the downtown area. Built as the W.F. Oakley Building by the father of the bank manager involved in the robbery, it housed the Tom Sanders Grocery followed by the Lewis Store. The building had a large stone pinnacle at the top of the front wall with W.F. Oakley inscribed on it. To the immediate south were two storefronts, very similar to Hunter's Grocery across the street with large windows and recessed doors. These storefronts were in a brick building that in the early 20th century was a two-story building before the upper story burned. Since the Lewis store building has been removed, the partial brick frames of the upper story windows can be observed on the north wall of the building. The storefront on the left of the building was Wakefield's Red Front Store and later Killingworth's Town Shop. Now that one's kind of interesting, interesting building there. I, a little bit of history on it. It was a, well, it was a dry goods store in later years, but when you went in to the left, you could actually pick up a trap door and there was a, a room downstairs. It was a barber shop. In recent years, it was discovered that there was a one room barber shop below ground. It may have at one time opened onto stairs leading to the sidewalk. There may be a corresponding room under the right storefront based on a bricked over doorway. The basement barber shop had brick walls, a fireplace, and a concrete and brick floor. A black and white 19th century portrait was found tucked into a crawl space between the back wall of the barber shop and the floor of the store. The right storefront housed Seaburn's Grocery, then Roy Windsor's Pool Hall, followed by Ben Oakley's business office. The pool hall had a reputation for having a rough crowd. The police were once called to the hall when a customer brandished a hand grenade that later turned out to be a fake. Adjacent to the pool hall was a livery stable, very similar to Wilkerson's livery across the street. 
This building was later converted into the town fire and rescue building. Next to the livery was a large hardware store with two front doors with glass block above the entrances. It was home to P.B. Cox and Wiley's Hardware, followed by Jernigan's Port City Hardware. Both stores had their name featured in large letters on the front wall of the building. Next to the hardware store was a two-story building that contained Windsor's Garage on the ground floor and the town telephone switchboard and Masonic Lodge on the second floor. On the northeast corner of Main Street and North Street and south of Windsor's Garage was a much smaller building containing Bowie's dry cleaners. It was faced with cinder block rather than brick and had once been the town alcohol dispensary. Around the corner and east on North Street behind Bowie's dry cleaners was Marion Oakley's cotton gin. This gin had been running since the 1900s when it was owned by R.L. Williams. Marion Oakley also owned the peanut processing plant across the street, whose large steel building was prominent on the Columbia landscape in the mid 20th century. Prior to the peanut plant, the land had contained ball fields for the town children. The final building on the east side of the downtown area was a small Woco Pep service station in front of the peanut processing plant. The settlement of Columbia began thousands of years ago. Native Americans made this confluence of the Omusi and Chattahoochee home. In the early 19th century, this area was the frontier between the Creeks and Seminoles. By the late 19th century, Columbia was a bustling and growing town. In the early 20th century, hydroelectric plants were generating power for the region. In the present day, the Columbia area continues to be vital to the region's electrical grid with the Farley nuclear plant. The town has a rich history that is kept alive through the efforts of the members of the Columbia Historical Society, which is conveniently located in the old Columbia Bank building downtown. Though the weather here can be warm, so can the hearts of the people who call Columbia home. Take the time to visit this innovative town along the Chattahoochee River.